Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee Community Update 2020. And my name is Ava Black, and I am the open source program manager for the confidential compute team at Azure. Uh, my pronouns are they and them. And here with me today is Karen. Hey everyone, I'm Karen Chu. I'm an open source community PM on the Container Compute Upgrade team, also at Microsoft Azure, and my pronouns are she and her. Let's get started. All right, so in today's session, we're gonna talk about the current state of the Code of Conduct Committee, including who our members are, what our purpose is, what our scope is, and our plans and progress around documentation. I wanna start with a little bit of background about the committee and our organization and our relationship to steering. Uh, there are five members of the committee, three in addition to Karen and I, and we also have uh, Tasha and Tim at VMware and Celeste at the CNCF. And the five of us are elected or appointed by steering, but then given separate powers, we don't actually report to steering, one of the few committees that doesn't. And this was intentional. Both of these committees are um, intentionally separate to hold each other accountable if that need ever were to arise. Um, also to note is that no more than two members of the Code of Conduct Committee are ever from the same company, and this avoids a perception of single party control. It avoids any situation where a conflict of interest might arise. Um, and if one were to arise, members of this committee, do we do recuse ourselves from dealing with that, and so there's enough of the committee still engaged in something uh, even if, you know, let's say something happened involving, yeah, one of the companies. Um, now, our purpose as a committee is to provide uh, and support and enforce a well-considered viewpoint of what constitutes acceptable behavior within a community, within our community. And to do this, we focus on a restorative model that believes in the inherent good intent of all members of the Kubernetes community. And we, we also believe that codes of conduct in general do not need to be punitive to be effective. Okay, so let's talk about the scope of the committee. Here we've mapped out some examples of environments that fall between official and unofficial spaces, as well as online and offline spaces. The committee is invested in all these different quadrants because they may involve community members and may affect both the health and behavior of the community. Eva, do you have some examples you wanna share? Thanks, Karen, I'd love to. So while the obvious uh, spaces online might be our GitHub and our Slack, or offline might be things like the Linux Foundation events, the Kubernetes, like KubeCon, like this. Um, there are less obvious ones. Uh, our podcasts and streams that people run, or a personal Twitter for a SIG lead, um, or a official meetup or an unofficial meetup, or even just a couple community members gathering together at a local coffee shop to hang out and talk about what's happening in their working group. Because all of these are um, spaces filled by members of our community acting in Kubernetes interest, we feel that this is part of what makes our space safe and welcoming for everybody. And especially true for uh, folks who are in a leadership position in the community, it's important that they reflect the values of the community and make it a safe and welcoming space for everybody. All right, next we'll talk about committee relationships. So depending on the environment, sometimes we work in conjunction with other parties, where the nexus to communicating with all these groups when there's an incident or concern, no matter where in the community it may have come from. So we're often involved in routing, helping to gather information if needed, and deciding what actions to take but we're often not on the front lines because all these bodies are empowered to act in their respective domains. So think of us as tier two support. And let's dive a little deeper into each of these bodies. With SIG contributor experience, we loosely advise them on, um, on when they have questions around like cultural aspects. So that's something we'll work with them on. Um, with Slack and GitHub admins, they're the frontline admins in their spaces. So not only do they have the jurisdiction over their spaces, they're also the ones to perform the administration of it and help keep it free from spammers and drive by trolling. But in rare cases, they will reach out to the code of conduct committee, mostly in gray areas or if there's a repeated issue. And lastly, when in-person events are a thing again, 
the Linux Foundation event team members are the frontline admins for those spaces because they're legally responsible for venues, for managing event staff, hiring security, etc. Um, nonetheless, though, we are there for them to help provide backup and to provide support for the community during face-to-face -face events. So what we do to foster an inclusive and welcoming environment uh, as Karen mentioned, sometimes we support working groups, uh, but we also support community members uh, directly. So if you are leading a working group or involved in one and would like our input on something you're writing or doing, or you want to start a working group and want to know our engagement early on, please just reach out. Um, but if you feel like an incident has happened um, and, and it's very subjective, also please do reach out. Uh, what does that mean to say an incident happened? Well, if any series of interactions feels non-inclusive or combative, or someone has an ill intent, um, you know, it's it's subjective. There isn't really a strict rubric for this. But we're all human, and historically, we've found that the majority of, of bad actors that we've seen were not actually part of our community. They just showed up like a troll on Twitter or a troll on GitHub to start trouble. Um, and while we have found that there are uh, generally speaking, a very small percent, but some bad actors in any system, we don't ask, we don't expect anyone in the community to distinguish between between these uh, if it feels unsafe to do so. We've chosen to take on and accept the responsibility of doing that emotional work here to differentiate between a legitimate concern or grievance or folks that might be trying to abuse the system or abuse and cause harm. Uh, this space is very nuanced and I want to just reiterate that we know we're all human. We're all trying to do our best. And if non-inclusive behavior seems to be happening, I want to talk you through a little bit of what our thought process is and how we respond to that. Um, we, we ask ourselves some hard questions to try and understand the greater context and what people's intent was before coming to any conclusion or making any decision. And I'll give two examples. Both happened on GitHub. And to Karen's point, the GitHub admins were the ones that handled these initially, but both were gray enough that they came to our attention. Um, in the first example, a, uh, a, a maintainer was perceived as uh, sort of over aggressively closing issues and the contributor got very upset, uh, eventually fired off some angry comments on GitHub and both of them uh, reached out to the Code of Conduct Committee to say, hey, something's wrong that the person's being bad. We investigated, we talked to both people separately, we looked at the GitHub histories and realized that this wasn't an intentional harm. Um, the, the automation had over aggressively closed things and so the contributor in this case didn't realize that their issues were being closed not by a human but by a bot and their anger was misplaced. Meanwhile, the maintainer realized that uh, the automation tools they were using were closing more issues than they meant to. And so they were able to modify the tools to better represent the intent they wanted in the community. And I'd say the outcome from this was pretty positive. Um, yes, some feathers were ruffled in the beginning, but both people are still members of the community and things improved. Now for a second example, uh, this happened after someone just uh, had just joined the community and began opening their first couple PRs. Uh, because of the demographic that they represent, they got targeted on GitHub uh, and someone began posting harassing comments uh, on their PRs. Um, and they were kind of ignoring it at first, but then it kind of it, it continued to happen. This came to our attention. And upon looking into this, we realized that the harassing comments were coming from someone who first of all wasn't a real uh, wasn't a regular member of our community, but they were uh, harassing people of that demographic all over GitHub. They were just sort of a drive-by troll who happened to come into Kubernetes space and cause trouble here. And so in that case, we did reach out to the GitHub admin team and ask them to just block that person from our spaces entirely. It's kind of a last resort, but um, it seemed prudent in that space in that incident to make our space safer for everyone. All right, so let's now discuss providing restorative support for a community and focusing on harm reduction. So our intent is to safeguard and build trust in the community. 
and all communications with the Code of Conduct Committee is confidential. This is a safe and private space when you come and talk to us. And what exactly does that mean though? So with whichever means of communications you choose to utilize, we never disclose to one party what another party has said about a situation. And additionally, we seek to verify reports without exposing the claimant while also avoiding potentially causing more emotional distress or jeopardy for that matter. Um, timeliness is important to all of us, so when you contact us, we'll try to provide a response within a day, and depending on the scenario, we may reach, may reach out for more information. Just remember, our goal is to find a path towards community healing and individual growth, and punishment is really our last resort. And where can you go to reference all of this? So the committee is still fairly young. Um, we have a lot to do, but we're committed to updating and publishing documentation around our goals and standardized processes. We're hoping that by making everything public and transparent, the community will have clear expectations when it interacts with us. So some of the docs that we're working on include how we receive reports and triage them, how we handle recusals, how we handle the logistics of incident Student response, educational materials that we can point the community to, and we're hoping to publish transparency reports in the near future. Earlier, as I mentioned, um, we also work oftentimes with other bodies that deal with code of conduct matters. So we're working on formalizing expectations and communication channels with these groups. This effort will also help define our scope better. So where to find us? Um, if and when you need to reach us, you can email conduct at kubernetes.io to reach all of us at once. But if you do want to reach out to us individually, you can just DM us directly on the Kubernetes Slack. Our job is to be here for the community. So as we mentioned, you should get an initial response back within 24 hours of reaching out. Now, if you are a SIG lead or a working group lead or involved in those, um, like I said, by all means, reach out. You can get engaged with us directly and early on. Um, and if you, uh, <clears throat> we, we want everyone to feel safe bringing their whole and authentic self here. So if you feel like something is off or something is wrong, please reach out. Um, please know that also our, our work happens mostly behind the scenes. So you may not really see it until we get, get uh, all of our processes matured enough to create transparency reports, you might not see what we're doing in the community unless you're in one of those six or working groups working with us, but know that we're here supporting you. Thanks for coming to our talk and we'll stick around for some questions. Thank you.